Hello everyone, welcome to this in-depth look at the Royal Enfield Interceptor 650. In this video, we're going to first start off with a detailed walk around of the bike. Then I'm going to give you some information in my review of the original accessories and riding gear that I have for the bike. And finally, I'm going to tell you what I feel and give you my verdict and review of the bike itself. So let's get into it. couple things that I want to cover as an introduction. First of all, this is my father's bike and I'll tell you a little bit later on why that makes a little bit of a difference perhaps and how I might have done a few things differently. Secondly, this bike is about two and a half months old. We bought it for 3.18 lakh rupees on road here in Bangalore. That of course includes the bike itself, all the taxes and the registration, a five-year comprehensive insurance and it comes with the Royal Enfield three-year warranty and roadside assistance. In this time we have done about 1,100 kilometers on the bike. So it has had its first 500 kilometer service but we're technically not finished running the bike in. All right let's start off with the walk around. I have driven a couple hours outside of the heart of Bangalore so hopefully it's a bit more quiet and I won't get disturbed. Let's start with the front of the bike. As you can already see, there are a few accessories that we have added to the bike, like the fly screen, the engine guard, the sump guard, and a pillion back rest for the seat. And I'll cover these in a little bit more detail further on. Up front, we have the headlight. It's a very classic retro designed circular headlamp. Um, it's always on in the low beam. When you're riding, you cannot turn the headlight off, but you can switch it to the high beam. And there is a pass trigger that you can use uh, while you're riding to just flash the high beam. The light itself is pretty good for I would say regular usage if you're going to be doing a lot of touring in dark streets out in the countryside where there aren't a lot of other traffic where there isn't um, there aren't street lights then you might want to upgrade this to a more powerful LED because the halogen bulb inside seems a little bit uh, budget and dim but again Here's one of the things that uh, there's a little bit of a difference because this is my father's bike and his usage is very, very different than perhaps somebody who's going to be doing a lot of miles on this uh, motorcycle because for him, it's a toy. He's just going to ride it for a couple hours on a Sunday and that's really about it. So for his, his requirements, for this purpose, this headlamp is more than sufficient. Um, so that's about it. Down here, this is actually a plastic fender, but I do like that it's shiny and it's got that metal effect finish anyway depending on the version that you have since this is the orange crush with in the basic color scheme um, all of these elements are in the metal finish or the chrome finish whereas if you get one of the custom colors then uh, all of this will be in black including the headlamp and the headlamp cowl the fenders the spokes um, and things like that but again this is something which is a little bit more classic in design because it's all chrome and I also think this is a better color scheme overall. Yes, the orange crush is a very common color, but you know, it's really good looking and I think it's uh, it's okay. Might not be that rare. The, the bike comes with Pirelli Phantom Sport um, S Comp tires, which we found pretty good again for the usage. Um, that we're going to be having that my dad is going to be using this bike for this, these tires are more than enough we did do some riding in the monsoon rain and never did I feel that uh, this bike or this uh, sorry the tire was not providing enough grip so I think overall it's a pretty good tire up front we have a single disc on the left hand side with a two piston bibray uh, caliper bibray as you might know is uh, by Brembo so it is a pretty pretty reliable brand. It gives pretty decent stopping power. The bike also has dual channel ABS, so that means on the front disc as well as on the rear disc. There is a Bibray dual piston caliper with the steel braided line, which gives you good feel. And overall, it has a pretty decent stopping power. It's not phenomenal. You do have to press hard 
uh, for it to really react quickly and stop. But since it has ABS, it feels quite confident. As we work our way over here, let's take a look at the instrument cluster. So here is the key for the Interceptor 650. There's a nice logo in the middle. It also says since 1901 in the bottom. So you know that what you're writing has a lot of heritage, but the key itself is modern with this laser cut um, design. When you turn on the ignition, you can see that the dials are fairly retro, predominantly analog. You get a large tachometer on the right side, which gives you some uh, lights like the ABS, the battery engine check oil, your indicator, um, if you're on high beam or low beam. So these kinds of lights are visible on the right hand side. There's also a neutral indicator, which if I were to turn on the, the ignition, there you go, you can see it now. On the left hand side, you get a speedometer. In this case, it's kilometers per hour and a small little digital readout. Um, this readout gives you the fuel gauge and an odometer with two trips, which you can just toggle with using this button here in the middle and also hold the button down to reset one of the trips. Um, already I can tell you, for example, that these dials look really nice even at night when you're riding, but I do wish that there was a little bit more sophistication in them. Like for example, this fuel meter does not really uh, show an accurate um, uh, representation of the amount of fuel left when you have less than half a tank. So right now it says I have three bars, but I know that if I push the bike upright, you know, and I'm riding within a couple of seconds or a couple minutes, it's going to show empty and start blinking. So it's not the most accurate. And even when you're riding, it kind of fluctuates when you're in the bottom of the, the tank. It doesn't give you a very accurate um, reading. Not a big deal, but I would have wished that they had a little bit better system for that. And another thing that my father says that he wish this uh, instrument cluster had would be that there was a gear position indicator. And I know that it's not really that important for most people, but uh, it does help nevertheless. Since there is a six speed uh, gearbox, you might want to just have that indication of which gear you're in. And I agree. And I think it would have been okay if the price was a couple, you know, 2% more or 3% more if, this, if the dials were a little bit more sophisticated. But um, here as well, there is a little bit of a change between the Interceptor and the, uh, the Continental GT because of course the handlebars, as you can see, are very different between the two bikes. Right here we have this three-piece uh, with the clamp and this higher set handlebar, whereas the Continental GT has clip-ons tucked away down here. The switch gear as well is pretty good. Again, for this price, I really cannot complain. Yes, there are better quality switch gear out there, but at the same time, this does, this does the job really well. Um, you have a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of good feedback and they make a nice clicking sound. So you know what you're pressing. The indicator lights don't have an auto shut off, which I also think they could have added. But again, these are all small things and I'm really nitpicking. These mirrors are the standard mirrors. You also get them in black as an accessory, but because this is the very chrome-based basic color scheme, I think this is a little bit better. You can adjust your gear lever, sorry, your um, clutch lever cable very easily here. And there's also a small locking pin, which pushes against this knurling to keep it in place. Um, and also gives you a nice clicking sound to see how many steps you are adjusting that uh, cable with. The tank is also quite nice. It's got a nice shape. Uh, some indentations here when you have your when you're riding to put your knee across. It does get a bit warm from the engine, but it's not uncomfortable. This orange crush color also has that metal flake, gold flake finish, which really glistens out in the sun. This tank holds about 13 liters, 13.5, I believe, but you're never gonna drain it out completely. The cap comes out completely, and then you just align it with the notch and then you press it in again and it just clicks in and you can see that the key becomes perpendicular again. So fairly simple, fairly straightforward. At the heart of the Interceptor 650 and of course the Continental GT 650 is the brand new parallel twin 648cc petrol engine. This engine makes 48 PS or metric horsepower 
at 7,250 RPM and 52.3 Newton meters at 5,150 RPM. But as low down as 2,000 RPM, you get about 70 to 80% of that torque. So it's a very linear power delivery right from the get-go. This is paired with a six-speed manual transmission with a wet multi-plate slipper clutch. So that means you do have to have fully synthetic oil. The engine itself has a 270 degree firing order and a counterbalanced shaft, which makes it really smooth and gives a really nice character. And it has a single overhead camshaft. The curb weight of this bike is about 213 kilograms. That's 213. Now, the frame itself is also pretty interesting. It's a steel tubular dual cradle frame, as you can see. And the engine itself, by the way, is air and oil cooled. So I think this engine really combines the best of retro design and philosophy along with modern technology. So it is, um, you know, air cooled, but it's also air oil cooled rather, which means that you do have an oil cooler right here. So you can see from down here from the oil sump, the oil gets out of the engine, comes up to this radiator, gets cooled, and then goes back down into the engine and therefore inadvertently cooling the cylinder block uh, from the inside. So you don't have to have a complex engine with jackets and you know for, for separate liquid cooling but with this oil cooler and the air cooling with the fins it's, uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty cool engine. It does run quite hot in the traffic but uh, it's not that bad compared to bigger bikes. Um, a bike that I, I'm going to compare this with of course is the Triumph Bonneville Street Twin but a bike that I'm a little bit more familiar with that I would also compare this with would be the, uh, the, the Ducati Scrambler. And the Ducati Scrambler runs quite hot even though it's liquid cooled as compared to this. That's also because the compression ratios are also a little bit different. Another thing that makes this more modern even though it's retro is the fuel injection. So you have digital spark ignition and though this kind of mimics a, um, a carburetor it's actually a port, inject uh, port, in port <laughs> injection system. You can see the rail here with one injector going into the port right here at the intake and similarly another one on the other side. While we're down here, I'm going to mention a couple of the accessories that I have purchased for this bike. So one of course is the fly screen that we saw up here, but another two that you can see down here for example is the sump guard and the engine guard. I think these two are vital um, because you can see the oil filter is right over here and you know we do have the elongated uh, fender for the mud guard and so you're not going to be kicking up that much dirt and water but you can already see with a couple rides out in this monsoon season there's a lot of dirt and grime and water that is coming in here and if all of that was going to hit the oil filter and kind of if there's any possibility for it, the water and the dirt to seep Beyond that, get into, get into the thread, start rusting this from the inside or getting into the oil and that could be a lot more uh, problematic. So it's just better to get one of these sump guards. And also for the sump itself in the bottom, since this bike doesn't ride necessarily that high, it has decent ground clearance of course, but it's not, a, it's not like the Himalayan. Therefore, it's good to also have some protection for the underside of the bike. Similarly, these engine guards are also, I think, crucial. You get four different SKU options. You get, this is the larger one. There's also a smaller one, which just comes over here in the bottom of the casing. Uh, and they're both available in this chrome color or in black. So a total of four different SKUs. I think this goes well with the Interceptor. Perhaps the, the smaller one goes better with the Continental GT. But again, because of my dad, I recommended that he get this. Um, it's been a quite a long time. I think the last bike he owned was a Kawasaki about 30 years ago. So he's, he's, not, uh, he's not used to bikes and a slightly larger guard is going to help, you know, when inevitably anybody, you might drop this bike because you're on sand and it's just better to have a bigger um, guard to protect the engine and the tank. Unfortunately, the exhaust and the silencer is going to hit the ground anyway, but at least this, this complex engine uh, and the tank will be uh, will not be damaged as much, hopefully. So I recommend getting these two for sure. The fly screen, I think, is a little bit more cosmetic. I did do a long ride on the highway uh, for a weekend at high speeds, around 120 kilometers per hour. 
it does help a little bit and you can see it's also taken a bit of battering uh, with some oncoming stones so it did save me from a couple stones being flung at my face and I think overall more than the functionality it does look really cool and I also think these three are definitely my suggestions for must-have accessories there's some other accessories that I'm also considering with my dad that we want to get you get a really nice knurled metal um, oil filler cap to replace this black one over here and I think that's it's a little bit more or more ornamental a little bit more pretty to look at and it doesn't cost that much it's only about a thousand rupees so I think we might get one of those later on as well so around the engine as well you can see of course these are the spark plugs but uh, it also has this little guard here to protect your knee from touching the the cylinders uh, when you're riding so that you don't burn your foot or your leg sorry uh, the truth is in the interceptor this is not really that useful because of the riding position and the placement of the foot pegs uh, you're not your knees are not really going to be that close to this in the continental gt it makes a lot of difference but it's there nevertheless and i appreciate that over here you also see some of the sensors one on each exhaust pipe um, just what the uh, the ecu requires to you know one of its sensors to manage the fuel air mixture and so on by the way during the first service i also got the ecu upgraded there is a new upgrade as of um, now it is the end of august 2019 so if you haven't had a service up till now you should because uh, there's an upgrade which improves the performance of the engine at higher altitudes so these sensors will see if there's uh, if the temperature is getting too cold and then we'll inject a little bit more fuel or just change the ratio to uh, to compensate for that so just get that quick uh, ecu update done speaking of the ecu you can access that by using your key to open the side panel which comes out very easily like that you can also store your documents and the um, the bikes toolkit is also provided here and if you pull this little latch then you can lift the seat up like that and down here you can see the ECU the seat also goes back on quite easily although it's easier said than done <laughs> with one hand but uh, there we go see I managed to do it so a testament to how simple it is you can change the seat to the more touring oriented one uh, because I've heard some people complain that the seat is a bit too soft but in all honesty I think it's uh, good enough actually because I really wouldn't want something harder than this and again here as well this is where it's going to be really dependent on your use of the bike like I said my dad is probably going to go for a weekend ride for a couple hours just barely out of town just for fun it's a toy so this seat is not that soft to be honest and I wouldn't want anything harder than this it has a molded design of this cross stitching even though it's not actually cross stitched this is just a texture that's all that's in that's part of the mold uh, but it looks nice again very retro and to the keen eye you would have already noticed another accessory that we have on this bike and that is the rear seat pillion backrest so this pillion backrest is the last uh, accessory that we've added to the bike so apart from the fly screen the engine guard and the sump guard this is the last one and i personally don't don't think it looks good and this is actually not even a royal enfield original accessory uh, because um, you know probably they figured it doesn't go well with the bike so they didn't bother designing and making one to try to make it fit this is an aftermarket product from a company called i think zana z-a or z-a-n-a -A. Uh, it was really quite cheap i got it here in bangalore at a shop in wilson garden called i, th um, I think a bike and biker or something like that for about 1600 rupees which is a little bit expensive for the quality i wouldn't have mind we wouldn't mind paying a little bit more for something which seemed a little bit better made but this is the only option and it's doing the job and the job is to make sure that the pillion doesn't go flying off the seat when you accelerate and again because my dad is going to be riding with my mom sitting behind him and they're not really used to motorcycles at all um, this is something that was really important for safety this backrest is really easy to install you just have to replace the four bolts down here one two and one two on the other side and remove the original 
grab handle, the grab reel that comes with the interceptor. Um, and then just replace that with this and these two bolts or these two screws hold the, the backrest seat up in place. And at that same time, you're able to remove the sari guard with just removing these two bolts up here. Um, it will just drop down. And I think that's another thing that we really wanted to remove <laughs> as soon as possible because it probably, it definitely doesn't look that nice. So where were we? We were still looking at this part of the engine. So another difference between the Continental GT and the Interceptor are the placement of the foot pegs. As you can see here, this is a separate unit, um, which brings the foot peg further forward and outward. Whereas for the Continental GT, it's a little bit closer and um, further, uh, further behind. Uh, but I think the seating position is really nice. It does mean your feet are going to be a little bit further apart. And another thing which a lot of people complain about, um, and I also feel is, is could have been achieved a little bit better, uh, is the, the placement of these foot pegs. Because when you're sitting down and you put your feet down, you know, this is exactly where your feet are going to be. And this is kind of in the way. And when you want to, you know, back the bike up with your feet, you're going to have to push against this. And yes, it is spring loaded and it moves away. But um, I've been doing this quite a lot and it already starts hurting the back of your foot. And I mean, I don't know if there was another way for them to have achieved this. Um, it might have been a bit too complicated since it is just one frame, one rolling chassis for the two bikes. There has to be a little bit of compromise. But this is something that uh, you're going to learn to live with very easily. It's not a big deal, but it's a, it's a minor inconvenience that you're going to notice right away. The rear brake lever also has pretty good feel. Both the brakes are a little bit more linear and progressive rather than sharp. You have a single piston bi-bray caliper and a smaller disc at the rear but does the job well. Dual channel ABS being what it is means that both these wheels or rather both these brakes have ABS which is really useful. You also can see a, a heat shield so when you're riding your knee does not scrape these um, these cables and wires and the lines over here you can see the reservoir for the rear brake and also the one on the top here you can actually replace the cap of this reservoir uh, but i think that's a little bit too frivolous that's my personal opinion you can see the the canisters for the gas charged shock absorber piggyback it's very easy to adjust the preload as well there's a, there's a tool within the toolkit, which will just clip onto this right here and you can easily just change the preload. But again, being my father's uh, motorcycle, we're keeping everything in a very soft, uh, soft setting. And it does, uh, it does handle really well. This dual cradle, double cradle frame is a really great chassis. It's a really great frame, very nimble, very confidence inspiring. Uh, yes, the suspension is a little bit soft and a little bit basic. But for the purpose that it's serving and for this price, you really can't complain. And you do have the ability to change the preload anyway. And the Continental GT actually comes with, I think, a couple steps um, higher on the preload out of the factory. So that also gives you a little bit more of a sporty um, feeling compared to the Interceptor. Another thing that's different about the Interceptor and the Continental, G Continental GT is the center stand. The Continental GT does not come with a center stand but the interceptor does, but you always have these, this uh, extra uh, uh, screw here, the screw hole, the thread to add the bobbin pins to lift your motorcycle with a paddock stand. Let's just take a look on the other side to maybe point out a few other differences. Here you can see the port injector uh, for the fuel injector a little bit more clearly since the throttle cable is not obstructing the view like it was on the other side. The clutch pack is also on the other side, but you can see the transmission over here. You have the gear lever. Again, this is a different kind of a gear lever. This is pivoting at the footrest, whereas um, in the Continental GT, because your footrest is further behind, it pivots at the, at the, at the engine case itself. Uh, just a little bit of a difference here and there. An open chain. Um, which goes to the back so you do need to maintain uh, you have to put a little bit more effort in maintaining it especially in the monsoon it gets quite uh, quite wet but um, yeah so far so good it's it's a bit too early to to review or judge that because um, you know it's a, it's a 
it's a brand new bike really um, the exhausts also I think look really nice they sound pretty good another thing that I would perhaps change is to first of all remove the baffles so that they're a little bit louder or perhaps you know somewhere down the line change the exhaust itself to something which is a little bit more louder uh, which perhaps my uh, you know my dad or other people might not appreciate you want something a little bit more subtle and quiet but I really want to hear you know the 650 parallel twin I want it to breathe a little, little bit better and uh, maybe it's something that I can look into later on but it's really easy to change you can just get rid of the shield there's a few bolts that you need to undo and you can just slide that off put your new one in and bolt it back up into place there's plenty of suppliers aftermarket guys who will be able to provide that for you air filter paper element air filter which is inside here to remove this panel you need to open up the other side first remove the seat and there's a screw that you need to undo and this uh, this uh, this plate comes out the battery is kind of tucked right in between right over here between the two that's also where you will find the fuse box um, so yeah easy access to some of these vital simple things that you can change on your own quick look at the back a really retro design rear light and indicators and yeah we also have the extended mud guard which is it comes out of the factory but you could remove it if you want it to be a little bit more blunt same with the ones in the front another thing we can just take a look at while we're down here are the welds you can see here these are all really nicely done and for people who are not used to Royal Enfields you might be like okay you know what that doesn't really make a difference what are you talking about all welds on all bikes look like this and the truth is no because Royal Enfield welds were not the best before and you could it was quite evident and visible in the past that they were not really um, the best quality but you can see how nice these welds are and they're probably all um, robot welds if not uh, you know some kind of a machine assisted and not 100% manually done so again quality in this bike is a lot better than Royal Enfields of the past and um, it's good to see that it gives you good confidence all right let's fire it up So that completes the detailed walk around. I already spoke about the accessories that we have, the fly screen, the, the guard, the engine guard, sump guard, and the not original Royal Enfield, but an aftermarket um, rear seat backrest and why and how I feel about them. Um, but let's take a look at some of the riding gear that I've also got for the interceptor. And these are all Royal Enfield original riding gear first is the drifter helmet so this is a helmet that we picked out primarily because of its design 
It's a very retro design. It's quite large, but it has a very large face. It's a full face helmet, which was one of my uh, criteria, but it's got a very cool, you know, retro street helmet design, complete with this magnetic um, leather strap to keep the visor down, even though it's not really required. It's ventilated. It's pretty sophisticated. This is an XL size, which honestly is a little bit too large. Um, but again, because of the usage, you know, my dad wanted something which is a little bit loose in the beginning. When I say loose, I mean it still fits really well. It's not going to fly out, but it's not as tight as a racing helmet would be for a super bike. But that's, again, not the requirement for, the, for this helmet that we had. And uh, it looks pretty cool. It feels really good. We have an adjustable vent to turn to open the vent and close the vent in the front to direct some air into your face and to prevent the, the visor from fogging up. Um, the vents here also are, um, there are channels within the inside, the padding as well, so that there is a little bit of breeze, a little bit of airflow within the helmet, uh, on your head itself, on your hair, so you don't get sweaty. All of the panels, all the padding inside can be detached really easily and you can wash them in the washing machine and just pop it back in. There's a vent at the rear as well to channel the air back outside. So overall, this is a really nice helmet. One thing I do wish we had done a little bit differently was actually the, the paint of this. This uh, is something that I'm not so fond of. There's like a big dot on the top and like a, a large stripe around the back of the helmet. There are other drifter helmet designs which have more you know, lines going this way, and I think those look a lot nicer, but when I was ordering this online, it, they were out of stock, and we went to a couple dealers nearby in Bangalore, and they didn't even have drifter helmets on stock at all. So I just kind of said, okay, we need one really quickly, because we had about three other helmets or, uh, at home, which were not, were not that great anyway, for some of the older motorcycles and scooters that we have. Uh, so, good helmet, nice design. Uh, maybe not excel if you really want to do high speed. I wore this when I was riding at 120 kilometers per hour uh, for you know about four hours, not at, not at 120 non-stop for four hours, but about four hours on the highway, and it was really good. It didn't move around too much, um, so it's still okay. It does look a little bit large, nevertheless. The next thing we got are these Rambler riding gloves. Again, Royal Enfield original ordered it online they have an end of season sale going on right now it's august 2019 so you get about 40 percent off these were not on sale but uh, you can get some other gloves as well it's pretty good it's quite basic but you get some abrasive material on the front you get some armoring around the knuckles and around the fingertips uh, it's quite light and breathable so it's it doesn't get too hot and sweaty and yeah, you need riding gloves when you're going on long distances and um, any pair will do. And this is just quite simple, black, nothing to report here. I think they're quite comfortable. This size is just L and that fits my hand and my dad's hand uh, just nicely. The last piece of riding gear that we have right now is the riding jacket. This is the Pushkar navy blue riding jacket. It's a summer jacket. It's not completely waterproof. It's really perforated. I mean, you could actually see through it. Um, it's really light, but it's it's uh, it's got a lot of abrasive material. It's got a lot of reflectors along the side and a big stripe along the back. Um, it's got armoring. Uh, I think it's CE class one or two. I'm not sure. So it's not really sophisticated, but there is armoring here and on the shoulders, um, as well as padding on the back. It's a very simple, a nice light summer jacket. You have um, straps along the side, around the waist to tighten it. You also have a zipper along the bottom to attach it to riding pants so that it doesn't keep riding up. You have two pockets with zippers on the side so you can keep your phone and your wallet when you're riding. And also a pocket on the inside over here as well. There's a lot of adjustments as well. Um, it has a two-way zipper, so you can zip it up and then you can, you can start unzipping it from the bottom if you're sitting down and you want to loosen it up a little bit, so it gives you that flexibility. You can also unzip, you know, around your hand. You can also tighten it 
around the wrist, around the forearm, and around your bicep, so that the uh, actual jacket doesn't flutter. So it's really, uh, it's a really simple jacket. It does the job well. It's got a nice Royal Enfield logo on the side, and it says the Royal Enfield um, over here, as well as a large Royal Enfield uh, logo here on the back. So I think it's a nice jacket. Again, something that you must is a must-have um, when you're going riding. So I recommend with the sale. I, this is, by the way, this is XL. And I think for somebody of my size, as you'll soon see in the footage, or you already have, um, it fits us quite well. We're about five foot eight, so it fits us really well this size. And um, we pay, the original price for this was seven thousand rupees, but with that end of season sale, we got it for I think four thousand two hundred, which is which is a great deal, really. The inside of the jacket around the collar collar is also this soft. Uh, anti-chafing material so your neck is nice and comfortable you, you can also remove the armor uh, the pads and replace them if you want they're easily detachable with these velcro here you can open them up and uh, replace them if you want to i wanted to show another interesting bit of riding gear that my dad uses it's called Backalign. it's a company in the u.s and uh, unfortunately it's not available everywhere but if you do travel to the u.s often just order it and pick it up when you're there. It's really useful if you're suffering from lower back pain, uh, like my dad does. This is kind of like a kidney belt, but there is a very special contour, uh, hard kind of foam plastic insert right here with a special contour to kind of keep your spine um, in a nice aligned position and supports it, especially in the lower back area when you're riding so that you know sharp undulations on the road or just the vibration and just sitting in that position all day or for extended periods of time this is something that really helps out and it's quite quite a simple belt and i would recommend you check it out and pick it up if you want back a line now let's come to the actual riding review since i don't have um, a microphone for the gopro nor do i want to stick it onto the helmet I'm just going to be playing some b-roll in the background and I'm just going to talk to you about what I felt when I was riding the bike. So I did uh, a slightly long ride over the weekend recently for about um, not too far, just about um, 600 kilometers over a couple days, but it was enough time to really get to know the bike. And in, I must say, first of all, <laughs> it's fantastic. I really loved the bike. For this price, I think everybody, any review that you've seen, I'm sure you've seen a lot. <laughs> it's hard to fault a bike, you know, which is so affordable. There are a lot of bikes which charge a lot of money and don't deliver that, uh, you know, what they promise. And that's where you start having problems with it. When, but when a bike doesn't cost much, everything it does kind of delights you because you're like, wow, I'm getting a great deal. And the Royal Enfield Interceptor is case in point because you get a lot of bike for your money. Let's start off with the riding position and the comfort. So the wider handlebars and the wider set pegs are quite comfortable. The seat itself, like I mentioned, for my purposes, my taste, I like this and the way it's padded better than perhaps having a harder seat. I did spend a similar amount of time on a similarly long ride on the Ducati Scrambler and it, which had a much more stiffer seat and actually I found that really uncomfortable. In fact in the Ducati Scrambler the foot pegs are also higher so I felt it was a lot more cramped and the handlebars were even wider so it was a little bit awkward and I didn't really find that comfortable. So compared to that this motorcycle is a lot more uh, forgiving, a lot more compliant and plush. The suspension might be a little bit basic and might be more on the softer side but on the highway, when you're just cruising at 100 or 120, that's where the soft suspension really helps out, absorbing the undulations on the road, especially here in India, where the roads are really quite terrible. Uh, it does a lot of, uh, it really helps, it makes a lot of difference. The speedometer and the tachometer, like I said, they also kind of fogged up a little bit. We were riding in the rain a little bit, and I don't, there was no, there's no water on the inside, of course. But at some point in time, I do remember rem uh, seeing that there was a little bit of haziness or a little bit of um, fog on the inside, which quickly dried away. But again, I wish these dials were a little bit more sophisticated. And when we parked it out, uh, when we were out in the countryside overnight, uh, we did put a plastic bag over the dials just to keep them as dry as possible. Um, but 
yeah the headlamp as well if you want to do you know long rides on narrow country deserted roads where there isn't much lighting um, I know like for example in Germany uh, even the autobahns don't really have uh, lights uh, in most places so there I would see why you would want to upgrade the headlamp and I think you can easily swap out the bulb with an LED there are a lot of aftermarket guys around here who do have a full LED headlamp that you can replace the whole headlamp itself I wouldn't go so far as to do that but just the bulb should suffice the 13 liter tank is okay for our purposes again traveling in a civilized world where every every 15 to 20 minutes you're going to find a petrol station it's really not a problem at all this runs on regular unleaded uh, gasoline uh, up to e10 uh, up to 10 percent bioethanol so you can find that kind of fuel anywhere it doesn't really need high grade high octane 98 uh, kind of fuel to run so it's quite simple and basic in that way which really helps out in touring in countries in asia uh, especially in india um, apart from that, the engine is really smooth, it's silky smooth, it has a nice linear power delivery, the throttle response is really sharp, um, the, it's a very instant reaction to the twist of your, uh, to your wrist to the surge in the engine. The linear power delivery continues, um, but between 3000 and 6000 RPM, even 3000 and 5000 RPM is where the engine really wakes up. It starts singing you can there's a noticeable change and a noticeable feel in the engine that's where it really is happy between three and five thousand rpm being in still in the run-in phase we did not really take it up to five thousand often just a couple times here and there but uh that's i think that's where the sweet spot of this engine really lies but on the other hand for long distances at high speed high rpm there is a little bit of buzzing on the foot pegs and on the uh the handlebars it's not unbearable you can replace the the grip with a slightly padded thicker grip which will absorb a lot of the vibration and of course if you have proper riding shoes uh, the foot pegs will also be much uh, I mean that that vibration will also be muted considerably the engine does not feel stressed does not overheat um, so that way it's it's really meant to do this at in sixth gear at 3000 rpm you're already at 80 kilometers per hour at 4000 rpm you're already at 100 kilometers per hour and the engine is relaxed it's it's like this is it i can do this all day so um, it gives you a lot of confidence to just ride all day and it's uh, it's really great the beefy front forks also help give this car a really nice sorry this <laughs> motorcycle a really nice planted feel out on the highway at higher speeds the brakes are also really um you know confidence inspiring very linear you have to press a little bit harder than perhaps you're used to on some other motorcycles but again it's just a matter of getting used to it um, in the slippery monsoon muddy streets that I was on in in some corner and in, in the middle of nowhere really I did see the ABS kicking in but it was a mild intervention so it's not uh, too invasive the slipper clutch also is really useful I was having a little bit of fun on some twisty roads that I found and was hammering down the gearbox and um, it felt uh, really, really composed with the slipper clutch, ensuring that the rear wheel does not lock. The pillion seat as well is really comfortable, especially with that backrest. I see how it's useful. For me, that's not really important. For me, a pillion uh, you know, seat is not a, a crucial point for me because I would always ride this motorcycle on my own. But for my mom and dad, it's something that's important to have. And this backrest really makes a difference, especially if you want to ride out together on a long distance um, journey, it really helps out. Um, apart from that, the fuel consumption, I'll be honest with you, I didn't check. Because the truth is, it's not something that's important to us. Um, I think when you're buying a motorcycle like this, you can expect decent mileage, but uh, we did not check. Perhaps in a later video, after the run-in period has been completed, I will talk a little bit more about that. The riding gear also worked really well at high speed. Like I mentioned, the helmet was stable even at 120 kilometers per hour. The jacket did not flutter. It really is a breathable design and perforated design. So it was really comfortable and hot um, uh, during the middle of the day when it's really hot. But you will get completely soaked, which <laughs> I did. So you probably want to get another jacket which has like a removable waterproof layer i just bought a separate waterproof jacket to wear on top of this um but um 
you can just get a, a, a much more sophisticated jacket. The gloves as well are pretty good. We just have to wear them in a little bit because they're initially a little bit stiff. And if you directly go on a long drive, um, you know, we found that, okay, our fingers were getting a little bit cramped uh, because the glove is a little bit stiff, but halfway through the journey, they were softened anyway. Um, so that was pretty good. They also are quite breathable. So I think those gloves I can recommend. For that price, again, not an issue at all. Um, the horn and the lights, the indicators, I think I covered most of that. The indicator does not turn off when you straighten the handlebar, which I think it should have done. Um, but the high beam and the pass are really easy to uh, operate with the switch gear. And the mirrors are also really stable at high speed. There's barely any vibration, so they give you a very cluster, uh, crystal clear image of what's going on behind you. And I think that's really crucial. And I was quite uh, satisfied with the performance of these mirrors. You can get bar-in mirrors for the Continental GT. I mean, you can get it for this interceptor as well, but I don't think it would go with the design. If you're looking for a true modern sports bike, then the Continental GT or the Interceptor are not really going to tick your boxes. Yes, 48 horsepower is a good amount. It's not a lot, but it's enough to keep you entertained and enough to give the bike uh, the performance that will keep you satisfied. It's not going to be blisteringly fast, but it's going to be quick enough, especially in uh, the Indian road conditions. 160 kilometers per hour, which is the um, the top speed of the Interceptor and Continental, is more than enough really for our road conditions. Yes, in Germany, for example, on the Autobahn, you probably will not be able to keep up with, you know, the fast BMW Motorrads or the big Kawasaki's, but driven or rather ridden in a leisurely manner, you know, on a nice sunny Sunday afternoon to have some fun and not necessarily set a new lap record, then both these bikes are really um, going to do the job quite well. 213 kilograms is a pretty hefty amount, but it's not too bad. Again, it's a good middle weight. In the city, you do feel that a little bit. The silencers and the exhaust pipes, which kind of jut outwards, also mean that it's not as narrow but it still is within your handlebar. So you can always use that as a frame of reference. But, um, you know, once you get moving, it doesn't really feel heavy at all. Only when you're trying to, you know, use your uh, feet to pull the bike out or, you know, go, go in reverse or make a three point turn does the weight kind of, you know, come to the forte and you realize, okay, this is a little bit heavier than I'm used to. And again, because of the way the foot pegs are placed, it's not that easy to get your feet flat on the floor. At five foot eight, I cannot really get that and get my feet down. But interestingly, because of the, the rare set foot pegs in the Continental GT, I can. So the seat height is fine. It's just because of the, the foot pegs that you kind of are sticking your feet out at an angle. So therefore they cannot really be completely flat on the floor. The gearbox as well is really nice. The Lever slots into place. You can feel each gear being selected with a nice clunk. Neutral is very easy to find. You'll never find false neutrals as well. The lever, the clutch lever is also quite light to operate thanks to that slipper assist. So even in the city, this helps you out and have a much more smoother, hassle-free ride. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. The clouds are setting in. It's monsoon, so I don't want to get stuck in the rain. So I'm going to wrap up this video. First of all, if you like the video, please hit a like, share and comment. Let me know if you want me to do more of these videos. If you guys know a little bit more about me, you might know that I do car reviews regularly on Autogefuel. I'll put a link to that channel down below. Do check out my car reviews on that channel as well. So my verdict for the Interceptor 650 is it's a fantastic bike. For this price, and it always comes back to down, comes back down to that price. It's a steal, it's a bargain. They're already gonna jack up the price here in India by 2% starting September 2019, which is just around the corner. 2% is marginal, doesn't make a difference, I know, but I'm sure they're gonna keep bumping up the price like this um, going forward because this is pretty much an introductory price. So I'm telling you right now, if you want a bike like this, don't think twice, just go ahead and get it. You can't go wrong with it and you will be really surprised at how good uh, the bike really is. The welds are all really nicely done. Um, the engine is refined. The riding position is good. The switch gear is pretty good. The dials are pretty good. Everything is, you know, much better than you would expect for a bike of this price point. 
So there's really not much I can complain, but the one main thing that still remains to be seen is how will I feel about this bike five years down the road? Will all these things stay the same or are they going to start slowly becoming loose and rattly and will need a lot of replacement? Only time will tell because this is a brand new platform, a brand new engine, brand new frame. So I really don't know what to say, but so far so good. And with a three-year warranty, you know, Royal Enfield is really communicating that they have confidence in this product and I have confidence in that and that's good enough for me. So thanks again. Hope you guys liked the video and I'll see you around.